Om Sam Saraswati Namaha Namaste. This evening we're going to begin our study of chapter 8 of the Devi Gita. Please, everybody, recite along with us. Sri Devi Vacha Idhyadi Yoga Yuktatma Tagin Mang Brahmarupinim Bhaktiyandi Vyajay Karajan Nasane Samupastita Abhisane Kitanguka Charam Nama Makatpanam Atrita Sarvamarpitam Ejapanandim Vishachakat Hita Janata Sadatvarinyam Param Viganadya Gvarishtam Prajanam Yadarchita Madhya Gundo Gyonducha Yasmin Loka Nekita Lokinishcha Tadei Daksha Param Brahma Sapranas Tadu Bangmara Tadei Tat Satyam Amritam Tadvail Dhyabhyam Somya Bidhi Tanurihitopanashadam Mahastram Sharangyupasanin Shitam Sadhaita Ayam Yatabhaga Dathina Chaitasa Lakshanta Devda Bhaksharam Sanyabhite Anabhotanu Kirsharo Yatma Brahmata Lakshamuchyate Apramite Nabhida Vyam Sararvatan Bhaktobhabe Yasmin Dhyosya Prithibi Chantariksham Otamana Sakha Pranishya Sarve Tamivekam Janatma Bhatnam Bhandya Vacho Mibuchatam Ritashyui Vasetu Aragi Bharatanapo Sangata Yatra Nadega Sahesho Tasturite Bahuda Jayamana Omiti Bhatyaya Statmanda Swasti Vaparaya Tamasa Prastat Divye Brahma Pure Vyogni Atma Sam Pratishtita Mano Maya Prana Shri Ratita Pratishtito Ne Rida Kansani Daya Tabhijyana Inda Pari Pashyanti Dira Ananda Rupa Mritam Yabhibhati Vedya Te Rita Kya Grantish Chityam Te Sarva Sanchaka Shiyante Chasya Kamani Tasmindrishte Parapare Iradvate Pare Koshe Virajam Brahma Nishkalam Tachubam Jyotisham Jyotis Tadhyatma Nabido Didu Natrata Suryobhati Nachandra Tarakam Nemo Vidyoto Bhanti Kuto Yamadne Tame Bhavanta Manu Bhanti Sarvam Tasya Bhasa Sarvam Itam Vibhati Prame Vita Mita Mita Purastat Prama Pashat Prama Andachinas Chotarina Adas Chordvam Chas Prasritam Prame Vedam Vishwam Barishtam Itadrika Nupavo Yasya Sakarto Uto Uto Inarotama Brahma Bhuta Nipasanatma Nasochati Nakanshati Dvithi Hade Imbaya Rajas Thabadan Bandhabi Vedina Natabhi Yoga Go and Be Pyasti Mabhi Yoga Pshi Tashyana Ahami Pasa Soang Sri Nishita Bidhi Parvata Madarshanam to Tatras Yad Yathra Kyadhi Stito Bama Nam Tirte Nakailase Poi Kunte Vanda Karkichit Vasami Kintu Magyami Ridhyam Bocha Madhyame Mapuja Koti Paladam Sakrim Magyani Nurchana Kulam Pavitran Tasyasti Janani Krita Kritya Ka Vishvambara Punyapati Chilayo Yasya Tetasa Brahma Gyananta Gyat Prishtam Kaya Parvata Sattama Katitam Tanvakya Sarbam 
नाथो व्याभ्यामस्ती इदंचेष्टाय पुत्राय बाक्तियुक्ताय सीलिदे शिष्याय चक्य सहोदक्या बाक्तव्यम नंजेतात पचित यशा देवे प्रभाते यथा देवे यथा गुरो तस्ते कतिता कर्ता प्रकाशन्ते मकार्पना इन्हों पश्चात्तम दिल विद्येश्या सजीवा परमेश्वरा यश्या हं सकितं कर्तुं समर्थस्तोतो रिनि पित्रोग्याभिका प्रोतो ब्रह्मचंबा प्रदायका पित्रिजातं चंबानस्तं नेतं जातं कदाचना तस्मेनाद्रुरे हदिदादि निगमाव दर्द्याप्तान नगा तस्मार्चास प्रस्याम सिद्धांतो ब्रह्मदाता चरुपरा शिवे रुष्टे तुरुष्ट्राता गुरु रुष्टे नसंकरा तस्मात्सर्वा प्रक्यते ना शिगुरं दोषकिं नगा कहीं मनसा भाचा सर्वदा धर्मोपबे अन्यथा हल्दु है कृता नास्यात कृतागने अस्नास्ति निष्कृति इंद्रियां नार्ता वायाक्ता शीरस्ति दक्षिति गया अश्विन्यां कतने तस्या शीरस्ति नां निपाजयिना अश्विन्यां तचिग्यो नष्टं त्रिस्ता भोज्यो दुरोत्पाव पुनः संयोजितं श्वियां Tavyamuni Sri Rastadam Iti Sankat Sampadhyam Brahma Vidyam Nagadipam Labdhagindhat Danyatsyat Krita Kritiyascha Bhutra Om And tonight we're going to discuss chapter 8 And the Goddess said Thus, by the various practices of yoga Unite the soul in meditation on me, the form of the Supreme Divinity. O King, devotees should become free from all afflictions, and sitting in a yogic posture should become fully present. You can't become fully present unless you're sitting in a yogic posture. Uh, you know, always, if our body is in a lackadaisical attitude, so will our minds become lackadaisical. Even in the military, they say, attention, and everybody assumes a posture of attention. It is manifest in union, moving in secret, in the most secret place it's hidden from all, whose name is a great word. All that is, all manifested existence and all life attains liberation in it. And by that, it, we mean that. That tat tvamasi, that it of the Bhagavad Gita that said, it is higher than the highest and greater than the greatest. It is the supreme divinity. It is the true of the true for all beings born, higher than the highest, and the most excellent knowledge for all that lives. It is brilliant, most minute amongst the small, and with it the worlds have been fixed as well as their leaders. It is the imperishable Brahma, the supreme divinity. It is life, it is speech and mind. It and only it is truth and the nectar of immortality. It alone is the beautifully pure knowledge. In the bow, place the arrow of Upanishad, the an arrow of understanding, literally sitting near, because in the Vedic Rishi era, the, during the Upanishads, all the disciples would come to their gurus and they would sit near and they would listen to this knowledge. So this understanding, the arrow of Upanishad, the arrow of wisdom, the arrow of the Upa Asana, the Vedanta, the Ant Abheda, the highest, the ultimate, the pinnacle of wisdom, the great weapon to come close to the vicinity of union. That's what we need is that wisdom to come close to the vicinity of union and then we merge. 
with an attitude of intuition. Direct consciousness to the goal. We only that beautiful, imperishable knowledge. And that's our goal. Just that imperishable knowledge of it that is higher than the highest, smaller than the smallest, the supreme divinity. Pranava Om is the bow. The soul is the arrow. And the supreme divinity is the target or goal. Ah, look at this beautiful analogy. In the arrow of Om, place our soul and take careful aim at the supreme divinity, which is our target. By means of full attention, the knowledgeable one will cause the arrow to strike that target whereupon he becomes me. Here, heaven, earth, and the atmosphere have their being along with the mind of all that lives. It is the only one, the soul of all beings born and no other. Leave all words, take this bridge to the nectar of immortality. So, oh, too many words, now we're keeping us in our minds. Leave all the words and go into the realm of intuitive cognition and deep, deeply intuit that nectar of immortality. Just as the spokes are attached to the hub of a wheel, in the same way all the naris, the subtle and gross channels of circulation, are fastened in the one. It moves within the interior as diverse, victorious thoughts. Meditate on the soul by means of Om, which will grant prosperity in rejecting darkness. We want to reject all the darkness, the darkness of ignorance and illusion and attachment. Om will bring the light. In the light of the fire burning in the city of supreme divinity, the soul is completely established. Remember this city of nine gates, two, four, six, seven, eight, nine. The city of supreme divinity, the soul is the lord of that city. Mind manifests as the life force and is established in the matter of the body, the most gross envelope of the Supreme Spirit gathering together in the heart. So here this body, physical, tangible body, is an envelope, the most gross envelope, the kosh, the kam, that contains the lifafa, that contains the, the, this Supreme Spirit, and it gathers together into the heart. By means of that knowledge, the perceivers see beyond to the form of supreme bliss. So now we've taken the knowledge of the gross body, and we're seeing that form, and now we're seeing the subtle body, the causal body, and uh, beyond. Pur, Pua, Swa, Maha, Janaha, Tapaha, Satyam. The supreme bliss to the nectar of immortality, to that shining light. So we're moving our consciousness as we did from the five koshas. Remember, the Annamaya kosha was the kosha, the consistency of matter, tangible matter, perceivable through the senses. And the Pranamaya kosha of the consistency of air, you can feel it, but you can't see it. And take all the Anamaya, take all the matter, all the perceptions and bring them into the breath. Take the breath and bring it into the heart. Bring it into the mind. Illuminate our thoughts. And all that exists is the Manamaya Kosh, all of the consistency of thought. And take all those thoughts and dissolve them into light. One great light of radiance, a splendor, began Anamaya Kosh, and take that light of wisdom, of knowledge, of knowing, of devotion, of purity, of clarity, and take that light and dissolve it into the sat chit ananda ananda mayakosh, where there is the supreme bliss. So now that that light, there was only that light and. I'm sorry, we're on verse 11. 
Okay, now cleaving the bonds of the heart and cutting the knots of all doubts with the destruction of these bonds of all activity, one is able to perceive the highest blessing. So here, we, when we take that all that bliss, we, we eradicate all the doubts. We take the bliss and put it into the light. We take the light and we put it into the thoughts. We take the thoughts and we put them into the breath. We take the breath and we put it into creation. And this creation is the manifestation of my breath, which is the breath of light, the breath of wisdom, the breath of sat. Chit-ananda, nourishing creation. Now we cut asunder all the bonds, all the knots of doubt. And oh, we, the, there's no more room for doubt. With the destruction of these bonds of all activity, one is able to perceive the highest blessing. That is, we perform without attachment. We've cut aside, asunder the bonds of all activity. The golden manifestation, the cosmic egg of existence, is the ultimate sheath, this ultimate kosh, this ultimate consistency, more subtle than the subtle, which re resides without attributes with the supreme divinity. It's unmanifest, but not devoid of existence, Davy, you had it right. It is unmanifest, but it exists. Just because we can't perceive it doesn't make it untrue. It doesn't make it un, 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 It doesn't make it uh, uh, false. When it the unmanifest manifests, then we can't say that something has come from nothing. Just like the energy in the battery is potential. It's stored. You can't even see the energy there, but it's not devoid of existence. It's unmanifest. And when you turn on the light, it becomes manifest. And then the potential energy becomes kinetic. The golden manifestation is the ultimate sheath with re which resides without attributes with the supreme divinity. That radiant light of all lights, that soul, is known by the wise. There is not the light of the sun, nor the moon, nor the stars, nor neither does lightning shine there, nor fire. It's unmanifest. All of these sources of light are manifested sources of light. That self-luminous, unmanifest it re radiates light of its own accord. It is not illuminated by something else. There only shines the light of all light that is if the light which illuminates all this existence or every other light. So the sun and the moon and the stars and the, the fire are all illuminated from the light of the it. The supreme divinity. Brahma, the supreme divinity, is verily this nectar of immortality. In front is Brahma, in behind is Brahma, in the south and in the north, below and above, this universe issued forth from the blessing of the chosen deity. And the chosen deity is your choice. Choose the deity from whom you want to say it issued out uh, from, forth from. Uh, for example, there are 18 principal Puranas. If you, uh, you read the Swami Purana, then there are 90. But there are 18. And in the Shiva Purana, Shiva is that principal chosen deity from whom issued forth the creation. In the Vishnu Purana, Vishnu is the supreme, supreme chosen to be divinity. In the Padma Purana, Lakshmi is the supreme chosen. In the Kalika Purana, Kali is the, They all tell all the same stories exactly, but from the point of view of the chosen deity. It's your choice. The ultimate freedom. You get to choose who is the supreme divinity to you at any point in time. And you can change that choice from puja to puja. 
or many times during the same puja. From temple to temple, obviously. Who perceives this with an attitude of intensity, he accomplishes his objectives and becomes a man of excellence. That means, huh? as many as there are individuals, so many are there ways to get to God. You choose the deity. He becomes the supreme divinity with a contented soul with neither grief nor desires. Because he becomes Sabarni. He belongs to all colors, tribes, castes, creeds. He's one with the world. He has no enmity, no division with anyone. From remembering a second, fear arises, O king. If there's only one, there can't be any fear. Without a second, there can be no fear. Neither can one be disunited from me, nor can I be disunited from him. I'm omnipresent. Then how can he walk away from me? I'm going to go with him. Whether he, he chooses to recognize me or not is his decision. But I, the Supreme, am always with him. I am only he. Also, he is I. With a certainty, this is known, O mountain. Where I am perceived, there, my Gani, the knower of wisdom, is situated. Anyone who can see me must be filled with wisdom. They have sufficient wisdom to control the appendages of the ego and to fill themselves full of devotion and to focus that devotion on me. That's well, wisdom. That's a lot of wisdom. Neither do I reside in any sacred place of pilgrimage, nor in Koilash, the home of Lord Shiva, nor in Boykunta, the home of Lord Vishnu, nor in any such place. But I dwell in the middle of the lotus of the heart of my Gani. Anyone who is filled with wisdom and the wisdom which controls the, the lower instincts, we call them Kam, Krod, Lo, Mo, Moda, and Matsadya, these six enemies of the soul uh, desire, uh, anger, uh, uh, greed, uh, uh, the ignorance of egotistical attachment, uh, uh, Moda, uh, just plain uh, uh, illusion, uh, uh, ignorance, and uh, Jealousy. He uses that wisdom to control those six enemies of the soul, and by that process, it inspires devotion to make himself totally focused. When you're devoted, you're totally focused. And the, the best definition for pure devotion is byakulata, the intensity, the sincerity focuses the devotion to the exclusion of delusion. Ten million times the fruit of my worship is received by him who makes offerings to my Gani. If you find a person of wisdom who radiates the light of wisdom, the sincerity of, of true devotion, if we serve that individual, we get more, ten million times more than worshiping me. His family becomes pure and his mother attains the fruition of karma. They we're talking about for a, the individual who serves a Gani. An individual who serves a Gani, a wise person, has the opportunity to learn and change their lives. And probably that wise person is going to instruct their disciple to how and where, and when, and why, and the meaning of how to worship me. That's the wisdom. Become devotees. Become a devotee and pay attention because of your love. You always pay attention to what you love. That's the wisdom. The universe becomes clothed with merit when you bow with respect to one whose consciousness is absorbed in the wisdom of supreme divinity. O oh, most true among mountains. 
The universe becomes closed with merit. All you have to do is bow to the wise one. The force of gravity makes blessings flow. They never fall, fall up. They always fall down. So we bow down so we can be the recipients of the blessings from the wise. All has been explained by me and there remains nothing left to be spoken. This may be conveyed to the oldest son who is filled with devotion and the repository of good qualities to disciples and others who are suitable, but it is not to be imparted to any others who are not. To those who have the highest devotion for the gods and equally for the guru, just as for the gods, to such as these should the meanings be explained so the great souls have declared. So give this wisdom to people who are pure and who are devoted and who, who are reaching out to, to really bring God into their lives. Don't, don't debate idle philosophies with intellectuals. Who imparts this instruction is to be regarded even as the supreme Lord of all. Whoever can share this knowledge, they're, they're turning us on to a whole new way of life. They're turning us on to a whole new set of aspirations and goals and a whole new philosophy, value system, so that we should really regard them as, as sent by God. They're messengers of God. They're one with God who has received the benefits of this excellent action, this instruction, has no capacity to be free from debt. It is said that a greater authority resides with a father who has bestowed birth in Brahma, in divinity. The father who gives birth to a body, his gift will be destroyed. But the birth in divinity is never destroyed. Therefore, do not cause harm to him whose speech has caused knowledge. Now, that means the guru who gives birth to wisdom. Remember, we are, we are striving to become dvija, twice born, once from the womb of our mother and once from the womb of wisdom. And the guru who assists and gives us that, uh, that birth, uh, his gift to us is greater because the father who gave birth to this body, his gift is going to be destroyed. One day we're going to put this body into the flame. But the father who gives birth to wisdom, the wisdom will never be destroyed. And it will attach itself to our soul and it will continue with us from birth to death, from death to birth. Therefore, in all the conclusions of the scriptures, who imparts the knowledge of Brahma, the supreme knowledge, is the highest guru. If Shiva becomes angry, the guru can save, but if the guru becomes angry, Shankar cannot. Uh, remember the story of the old crow. Uh, remember the, the crow, he, he, was, uh, he was talking back disrespectfully to his, uh, to his guru and the guru kept saying, my disciple, please, please behave yourself appropriately. Show respect. Do what you say you will do and tell the truth. No matter how many times the guru pleaded with the disciple, the disciple never re re assumed a respectful attitude and looked for ways to cut corners and cheat. And one day Shiva got mad and he said, Hey, you worthless disciple, your guru is pleading with you, begging with you, please behave yourself. And still you are misbehaving. I curse you. Take 1,000 births in the lowest form of, of a creation. And the disciple immediately became a crow. And the guru bowed down to Lord Shiva and sang him a beautiful hymn of praise. And Shiva said, I'm very pleased with you. What, what boon would you like from me? And the, dis the guru said, my, my disciple was wrong, but he's my disciple and it's my duty to protect him. So please withdraw your curse. And Shiva said, I cannot withdraw a curse that has been given, 
but because of your devotion and your humility, I'm giving him a blessing. And I, whatever birth he takes, he will remember the name of Ram. And that old crow Bushundi became famous throughout the generations as the expounder of the Ramayana. Therefore, sparing no effort, the respected guru should be pleased, O mountain, by body, mind, and speech, always that is foremost. Otherwise, if a disciple be ungrateful in his lack of gratitude, he destroys what he has accomplished. When Indra taught Atharban, this wisdom, he took the promise that he would sever his head if he ever imparted it to another. The Ashwin twins asked to learn from Atharvan, whereupon he told that the wielder of the thunderbolt Indra would cut his head if he imparted the knowledge. Then the Ashwins cut the head themselves, replaced it with another one, and received all the knowledge from that excellent divinity. When Indra cut the head which spoke, then again they affixed his own original head, <laughs> and then the wise man kept his head. And thus, great difficulties must be overcome to attain the knowledge of the Supreme O Chief of Mountains. That is, he, he, the, the, the guru, Atharvan, uh, was told that if he would tell the, this knowledge, Indra would cut his head. The Ashwins came to him and said, we want the knowledge. He said, I'm going to lose my head. He said, I'll tell you what, we'll give you another head. Huh? You can tell us the knowledge, and then when Indra cuts that head, we'll put your original head back on. He said, okay, that's a deal. So you have to be ready to sacrifice and make a, a, a great difficulties must be overcome in order to achieve this knowledge. Whoever obtains it is blessed and attains the effects of, its, of his actions. Om. And now let's see if there are any questions or issues. Yes. Now I stay Kumari Ma. Uh, verse 7 says, Leave all words. How should the mind of a spiritual seeker think? Can Swamiji comment? Yes, Kumari Ma, when you leave all words, you, you enter into the uh, uh, Bij Mantra. So remember, we talked about the path of sound, and there was Shabda, and there was Vedic Shabda, and there was Bhotika Shabda. Bhotika Shabda is all the words of the world. And Vedic Sabda is the words that bring us back to the union with the Supreme, with the One. So leave all words, leave all the Bhotika Sabda, all the gossip about the descriptions of the world. And follow the path of the, the, the Vedic Sabda, the words of wisdom, which take you to the Bija, which is the subtle, the most subtle, audible abbreviation of the subtle principle. And from the bija we enter the knob, which is the subtle vibration. You just leave the intellectual understanding and move into the subtle vibration and the feeling. And then from the nada you move into the bindu and you, where you become one. And then you move into shabda brahman, which is the sound that only God can hear. So here, leave all the words. Get out of your mind. Most of us have already done that. Swamiji, a question from Usha from Canada. Namaste, Usha. Ma. Usha says man manifestation is itself a concept of the mind. It seems to me that many things can be perceived by the purified mind that, that are normally termed unmanifest. Total perception would have to include the so called manifest as well as the so called unmanifest moving past the mind into the unity of the two. Before that, each layer has to be just be different perceptions of the same things. Can the so-called unmanifest be perceived through the mind, even if it's purified? Absolutely not! <laughs> Sorry, Usha. No, it, it, it's, it's not possible because the mind is a manifestation. 
And mind perceives objects and relationships. It, it, mind perceives forms. Mind does not perceive the unperceivable or the unmanifest. So how can the unmanifest be perceived through the mind? We can only cognize the unmanifest through intuition or through meditation. And that's our objective is to use the mind to stop the mind. Where we can't go any farther be with the mind, the mind stops. And when we stop the mind, then we have the capacity to move deeply into intuition and then we get more subtle and more subtle until we just know a priori knowledge. So I need a question from Nanda from San Jose. Namaste Nandama. If one does not have an Ishtadeva, a Vila deity, can we begin with choosing any deity and will that deity ultimately Probably not, Nandama. Uh, you wouldn't want to just choose any deity at random. You would first ask your guru, what deity? Uh, uh, this is a, a, the shloka from the Rig Veda, uh, from uh, uh, ancient times. Kasmui devaya habisha habi To which deity should I offer my oblation? Uh, this is the uh, main question. If first thing, follow the deity, follow the paths enumerated by your guru, demonstrated by your guru. If you don't have a guru, then choose Shiva as your first deity. Because Shiva's mantra has five letters, and Shiva is the easiest system of worship. You can worship him uh, with devotion or you can worship him with mantra and he will teach you more and more about worship and how to get deeper and deeper absorbed in worship and then he will bring you to you, your guru who will bring you to your ishta. I don't know that it's appropriate or necessary to uh, 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 just choose a deity at random. I think it's more appropriate to follow a system of knowledge and learning and expand upon it in increments. Someone came to me uh, one time, he said, I'd like to have uh, initiation in the, uh, in the 16 lettered mantra. I said, uh, have you taken initiation in the nine lettered mantra yet? They said, no. I said, well, wait, if you don't know the nine letters, how will you know the 16? Uh, why don't you start with the five letters, Om Namah Shivaya? So these will be very important to us as we proceed according to plan. Don't jump. Have a question from Edward from Seattle. Namaste, Edward. Namaste. Uh, Edward, can you please explain the meaning of Namaste in Sanskrit? Or Absolutely. Edward, do you know what? In chapter 12 of the Chandi, it says, whoever listens to these mantras gets all the benefits. It doesn't say anything about it, whoever speaks the mantras. Because the objective is to listen to them and to listen them deeply inside. And hopefully, as I'm speaking these mantras, then you can listen inside, and as I'm reading these translations, you can look for applications in your own sadhana, in your own life, in your own spiritual evolution, so that you, Edward, move towards your goal of supreme divinity as well. Oh yes, there is tremendous progress in just having satsang and listening to the scriptures being recited. Kumari is asking Samaji, what in your opinion is the most important thing once you learn from the Devi Gita for those who wish to make rapid spiritual progress? Can I reserve that until the end of the class, Kumari? Uh, there's some really neat things in the Devi Gita. Uh, it, there are just so many pearls and gems that are, are in, in embodied in this text. Uh, 
But fairly soon we're going to talk about devotion. And to me, that's the most, uh, the most dynamic of all the chapters for me, uh, is the chapter on di devotion. Uh, so now we've talked about the, the various parts of the story. Uh, we started off in chapter one with the story uh, of uh, how these, uh, how Br uh, Shiva and Vishnu became without Shakti, and then Brahma requested his sons to perform tapasya. In chapter two was the story of Daksha, uh, his enmity with Shiva, and uh, Sati. Devi left her body and then she was cut up into 108 Shakti Pitas. In chapter 3, we talk about Parvati uh, gave the boon to the gods that she would take birth in Himalaya's house. And Himalaya asked her the question, what kind of dad should I be? How do you, how does one how does one guy, uh, just a little old mountain like me, become the father of the mother of the universe? Wow! In chapter 4, she started describing the forms of Maya in the gross body, the subtle body, the causal body. And she took us into the realms of Nyaya philosophy and taught us about uh, how do you use logic to understand where she is? How do you discriminate? In chapter 5, we were talking about the manifestation of Maya Shakti, and she gave the darshan of her universal form. In chapter 6, we talked about the goal of wisdom, and how do you control your mind? In chapter 7, we discussed yoga, and the various asans and pranayams that we use in order to propel ourselves to that union. And now here in chapter 8 we're discussing meditation so that we come deeper and deeper into the recognition of it. We come into union and we go beyond the niti niti. We go beyond the words into the experience of that neti neti, which in this chapter we're calling it. Oh, Kumari, it's difficult for me to choose one principle. I, I, I could sing a Bengali song. Uh, it says, Ma ache narami achi, bhavna ki ache amar, ma erhati kai ami, ma niche sakal bar. It says, the Divine Mother is, and I am, and who can describe my feeling? <laughs> I'm eating from Mother's hand, and Mother has taken total responsibility. Other questions? Uh, yes, Usha. Uh, is, is intuition then term something beyond the mind? Absolutely, yes. Definitely. We, uh, intuition is beyond thinking. You feel it. You, 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 you know it a priori. You know it through meditation. Intuition is a direct apprehension of consciousness. We are aware there's a recognition, but it's not an intellectual something that comes from the mind. So we are striving to reach the intuition and cultivate that intuition and develop that intuition so we can perceive wider and wider our loka, our paradigm of experience becomes greater and greater because we're not only using sensory perception, prataksh, mental construction, concepts, in pratyai, but now we are in prakash, intuition. The conscious, uh, consciousness is aware of itself. So how do we cultivate intuition? With all of these practices are designed to cultivate that intuition. We are leaving, we're uh, leaving our gross perceptions. We're bringing our awareness inside. We're focusing our attention and we're creating this intensity of reality, this bhava, bhava bhakti. The attitude of devotion, which makes us pay 
more attention, it focuses our awareness. These are ways, these are all tools, even the study and this discourse is a tool in the cultivation of intuition. Namaste, Ralph. Does a saintly person need to take some kalpas, even though their behavior would probably be the same, whether bound by some kalpa or not? Absolutely, yes. Yes, Ralph, everybody wants to take a sankalpa. Uh, e even if it, uh, if it be a limited sankalpa, we take a sankalpa to eat our dinner. Uh, you don't just take one bite and walk away. You take a, a sankalpa to eat the nourishment that's provided for you. It, it's, uh, it may not be a formal sit down, to, uh, I am now pr promising to eat everything on my plate, but it, it, there is an unspoken sankalpa as well. These are definitions of our goals, our aspirations. And even a saintly person has goals and aspirations. They are not just wandering in life, they are controlling their own destiny. They're not subject to, to circumstances, reacting all the time. They are controlling the circumstances to fit their goals. So, yes, Rolf, uh, uh, even saintly persons will want to uh, take a sun cold. They require to. Samadhi, Wendy from New Jersey has a question. Namaste, Wendy Ma. You can't. They are inseparable. Uh, they're only separable as we, in books where we talk about the yoga of devotion, the yoga of knowledge, the yoga of practice. But in reality, the more you love, the more you want to learn. The more you learn, the greater is your capacity to demonstrate that love. The more you demonstrate that love, the greater the love is enhanced. The, and it's a vicious cycle, which came first, the chicken or the egg. I don't know if that's a, 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 some, an issue that we want to resolve tonight. Samadhi Kumari wants to know in verse 11, yes. the Lord speaks about the highest blessing. What is this blessing and how to receive blessings? Well, there's the blessings and then there's the highest blessing. And the highest blessing is that wisdom that makes us so devoted that we can't think of anything else other than the beloved. And that's the highest blessing to unite with supreme divinity. Now there are other blessings. Uh, it, we get to be blessed to be good soldiers, good citizens, good citizens. We get to be blessed to make a sacrifice for God. We get, to, we get so many other blessings through the circumstances of life and through our aspirations as we pro pro proceed through the circumstances of life. How do we navigate the, this labyrinth of life? Uh, are we uh, going in a million directions at once without focus or have we actually undertaken to define our goals and chart our, our course and make our budget and proceed along our way with efficiency? Uh, now these are all different kinds of blessings. The quintipulation. Aha. Uh -huh. Namaste, Kumari. <laughs> wow. I assume by the quintupulation of the elements we are talking about the Panchakritya process, where earth, water, fire, air, and ether are uniting with the, each other in order to make the elements uh, manifest. Now, the reason that we want to study this information, this cosmic information, is that it takes us away from concentrating on the most important star of my movie, me. 
And rather than thinking about me, 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 or as the song said, I, 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 uh, instead of thinking about I all the time, I'd like to think about you and your creation. So now can I study cosmology? Can I study a, a, a metaphysics? Can I study the origin of the universe? Let me look at science. Let me look at something objectively without imposing my own individual preferences and, and prejudices upon it. Can I look at reality without the imposition of my prejudice? This study will teach me to do that and help me to cultivate that attitude where I can give up that constant, I don't have to be the star of the movie anymore. And that's why. There's a question on Pranayama in chapter 7. Yes, please. Uh, it's from Nanda. Yes. You can do it either way. As we have written in the, in the Samasti Upanishad, in the Cosmic Puja, the uh, Bhut Shuddhi uh, Vidhi, we are counting the Bij Mantra 16 times in each of the chakras, in each of the subtle centers of energy, as we bring the energy up. So then that pranayam will either be one breath where you recite 16 times or you can do 16 breaths per chakra. I personally don't have enough patience to do 16 breaths per chakra because my puja is three hours long and my pot is three hours long and I get breakfast at one o'clock <laughs> on a good day. So I, I take the shortcut. But if you are really devoted, Nandama, you could chant 16 breaths per chakra. Or you could chant uh, oh, oh, 16 times in one breath. chanting 16 times in each chakra or bringing all of them up 
and all of them down. You can take your pick, Nanda. Nanda also was wondering where the Bindu Chakra is. Uh, Bindu Chakra is often shown as above the Rodhini Chakra. So it's about uh, just at the hairline, almost in the center. If you put the Agnya Chakra right in the third eye, and then you put just above that is Kailash Chakra, chakra, and then there's the Rodhini Chakra, and then at the hairline is the Bindu Chakra. Also, some people use the Bindu Chakra as another name of Sahasra. So well, it, both are appropriate. No, you should attempt uh, pranayama as you're developing your asana. It will increase your capacity to sit still. Uh, the fact that you can breathe will make your body more comfortable. And it will make it, the fact that you can bring your senses to a state of focus, a pratyahara, and bring them inside as dharan, then you can, uh, you can increase your pranayama and increase your asana. And they'll all expand it together. So don't try to isolate each practice. But, one caveat, do, do the yam and the niyam first. Make the goal of your life. Make the goal of your sadhana. Make the discipline of your sadhana and make a regiment, a budget for your sadhana. And make it a regular, routine, budgeted, scripted sadhana so that it's a, your discipline before you try to sit. If you don't have a goal in life, you'll sit down and close your eyes and you'll say, Om Namo Shibaya, what shall I do today? Om Namo Shibaya, what's going to happen tomorrow? Om Namo Shibaya, how am I going to pay the rent? Om Namo, and your mind is going to go in a million directions. Your mouth is uttering these mantras and you know you're not doing sadhana. You have not yet resolved the basic issues of your life. What's the sadhana? Om Namo Shibaya, now how am I going to cook dinner? Om Namo Shivaya, where can I get a free meal? <laughs> Believe me, I have met many, many sadhus. Om Namo Shivaya. Swamiji, in this connection, another question from Nanda. Uh, chapter 7, verse 6 talks about controlling the diet. Can you please recommend a diet, do or don't, for sadhus and sadhikas? Thank you very much. <laughs> Big question. You should ask Srima that question. She spends a lot of time nurturing her children. Uh, I'm the type of guy that eats just about anything that falls on his plate. Uh, but I am a strict vegetarian. And uh, the reason I'm a vegetarian is because I try to sit in the asan for longer periods of time during the day. And also I try to control my senses and I try to uh, um, practice meditation. And because of that, I eat the food that's most conducive to the, uh, uh, to the objects that I'm trying to accomplish, to the, to the goals that I've set for myself. I don't believe in putting diesel in a gasoline car. I believe in taking the fuel for this vehicle according to the work that I want it to do. I've seen many wrestlers and boxers and fighters and football players eating dozens of raw eggs and meat and, and so because they need that kind of aggressive energy and they, they eat the food according to their occupation. If you want to be a, a Brahmin by nature and make contemplation the the goal of your life, then eat sattvic food, which is healthy, which is pure, which is clean, which is easy to procure, easy to prepare, easy to consume, and easy to digest, and easy to clean up afterwards. 
That's my advice, Nandama. I, I, I would say, take the easy way out. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Kiss. So, a question from Minima from New Delhi. Namaste, Minima. In this light, Nilima, they are all one. And there is only oneness and unity. There is not the light of the sun or the moon or the stars. And there's no lightning or fire. Because there's only unity. There's only one light of radiant splendor. All the other lights have come to this source. They have all been withdrawn into the source of all life and this light is the light of all and it illuminates all that exists and it illuminates every other light. Uh, and that's the light that we want to shine. We want to perceive that light and we want to radiate that light. Uh, they, it, only in some traditions, um, there, and generally Vaishnava traditions, uh, Nanda, uh, specifically uh, Goryomat Vaishnava, uh, a, a refrain from onions and garlic. I, I was uh, very surprised. I went to a Vishnu temple in Rajasthan and I had a, a lunch with all the sadhus, and first they gave me some onions uh, on, my, on my leaf. And I said to the, to the man who was serving, uh, uh, what kind of Vaishnava ashram is this? <laughs> You're giving onions and uh, is, the food, is the food pure? And he said, sure, it's pure. There's nothing wrong with onions. <laughs> uh, so it, some do, some don't. We do not in our tradition. And the reason we do not is because they contain heat and they create a heat in the body which makes the mind anxious. And the, it's not just about it, it stimulates sexuality, uh, but it's, it makes the mind anxious and it makes you a, a little acid reflex. <laughs> and so it makes, you can taste that onion for the rest of the day and try and brush your teeth as many times as you like, sit in the asan and keep eating that same onion. <laughs> For a long period of time, it's not bad if you're going, you know, if you're sitting on the couch watching a movie, but if you're trying to do pranayama, <laughs> it may be a little difficult. So eat the food that's conducive to performing the job that you want to do. Now, if you want to do it all, eat everything. <laughs> yes, Marsha, namaste. No, it's not true. Car carrot is it's, uh, clean, it's pure, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, conducive to health. Some people say that foods that grow underneath the ground in dark places are rajasic or tamasic. That includes potatoes, muli, um, uh, uh, we got radishes, uh, daikon, um, uh, scallions, uh, uh, and of course carrots. Uh, that there are other people that say, no, look at the effect that the food has in your system and how does it uh, 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 function for, for, for you as an individual. And then you can understand. Does that create a negative or an anxiety or a, uh, an apprehension or an aggressive energy? If so, then I would say it's rajasic. But if it's conducive to health, it's clean, it's pure, there are no digestive problems with it, it gives you energy, it's, it's uh, probably sattvic food. Now, if you were to put a lot of spices on top of that carrot, <laughs> you could change the character of that carrot very quickly. But otherwise, in its, uh, uh, of its own nature, I would suggest that the carrot is very sattvic. Om Sang Saraswati Namaha. 
नमस्ते